basically this yellow paper that we wrapped around this, that's about the size of a weed head, that glass tube. What Carl tells me is that when we put this fungicide on that weed head, we need to have fungicide all around that weed head. And he'll explain to you why in a little bit. I learned that this morning myself, so I'm excited to learn what he has to say as well. But, but that's the bottom line is what he told me. How do we get the coverage on the front and the back side of that, of that weed head? And so we just put some nozzles on this and ran across here this morning. And I'll send these around and let you look at them. But this one, you can see that uh, when you got blue spots, that's where you got the water, that's where stuff has hit the weed head. And so we got some nice sparkly blue spots there, and you turn it around on the backside, and we don't have so many nice sparkly blue spots, which means we didn't get coverage on one side of that, of that weed head. Okay, so why? How do we do that? All right, let me ask you this. I got a bunch of different nozzle tips up here. They're all different colors. Do the colors mean anything? Maybe a different size hole, yeah. So there is some standardization of this and that's what I want to talk about a little bit is is some standardization in fact let, let's go ahead and pass a couple of these around and uh, what I have is is some nozzle I want to look at some nozzle sheets so I'm going to grab one here these are all different it's different pages out of a book but at least I want you to look at what what you see when you see a spec sheet for nozzles these are colorful so when you get a page out of a nozzle sheet they're all different colors and the colors actually mean something and they're generally tied with the flow rate that's coming out of that nozzle tip so that's kind of the first thing we start with when we think about all right what's the flow rate how much is coming out of that nozzle tip all right and that'll tie to how fast I'm going to drive through the field and what my application rate is going to be, how many gallons per acre that I'm going to be putting on the field. So I'm going to, going to put those together. But the other thing that is really critical to the wheat stuff, to the, the fungicides and stuff that we're putting on, is what is the droplet size. Okay, so I want, what do I want when I'm controlling this stuff? Small droplets or big droplets? Small, okay, so small would be really nice. Yeah, but what's the problem with small droplets? They're gonna blow away, right? So there's the trade-off. So shoot, how do I do that? All right, and what are the droplet sizes? So first of all, how do I know what the droplet size is? And let's go back to the colors. So if you got enough sheets around there, or at least one you can look over somebody's shoulder and look at. And I gotta say, everybody's different because these are different pages out of a book. But I at least wanted to show you what's going on here. Um, so you should somewhere down on that sheet, you should have a red block on the left hand side. You got a red one somewhere? You see that? That's one I always look at. So there's a number on that thing and it probably has some letters in front of it, but then it's probably like a uh, 80 or a 110 and then it probably ends in an 04. Is that right? Does your number do that? So if it's red, they all do that, okay? See, I'm a magician, so everybody got a different nozzle tip and it come out that way, right? So. Now, now what's interesting is look at the flow rates over there. So the next column beside that red block is probably the pressure, right? Are you seeing that on the table? So look at 40 PSI. And then I want you to go over there and look at the capacity for one nozzle in gallons per minute. What is the flow rate of that red one? At 40 PSI. What is it? Four tenths, okay, 0.4. What's the number on that red nozzle, the last two numbers? 04. Ah, there you go. So there is a standardization, and they're color standardized by that flow rate, okay? So they're standardized around 40 PSI, most of those nozzles. So that'll give you something to, to know that you're going with when you're picking out nozzle tips. So an 04, a nozzle that ends in an 04, is probably going to be a red nozzle. Most manufacturers will follow that standard. And at 40 PSI, you're going to get 0.4 gallons per minute out of it. So they are standardized. Okay, and then one of the reasons for that is you got a whole bucket full of these things, and you're not going to stand there all day trying to find a number on them because you know a lot of you're in the same boat as me. You pull your glasses out to find the number, but the red I can kind of tell and figure out what it is. All right, so those are standardized right off front. So, all right, makes sense. You see that? So you, know, you can get down the line. You know the yellows are an O2, so that's 0.2 gallons per minute at 40 psi. So that's something we know. So we know those flow rates. So you learned something already, right? So we're good, pretty good there. All right. So what size droplets am I going to get out of that nozzle tip? So that's the other question because it's one of the things I'm really going to want to know for what I'm going to put out in the field here. So hey, I can figure that out. Probably the third column or second column, depending on how you look at it there, the one right beside the PSI tells me something about droplet size. Does it on your sheet? 
So most of them do that. And we have colors there, and we also have letters in there. And if you got your glasses, maybe you can kind of look at those letters. All right. Your so, hand lens. Yeah, there's yours, your hand lens. All right. <laughs> so do the letters make sense to you? What are they? What should you see in there? You probably see some C's, you see some M's, maybe see some F's, and maybe a VF. All right, what do you think that stands for? What's that? Very fine, yep, yeah, medium, C is the course, yeah. So again, these are standardized. So there's actually national and international standards written that say, okay, to be classified as course. So when I have a nozzle that has coarse droplet sizes, there's numbers, and I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but you could look them up. It says, okay, this droplet size, you know, on a statistical distribution of so many at this microns and so many at this microns and stuff like that, if it follows in to all those standards, then it's classified as coarse or very coarse or fine or medium or whatever, okay? so. Now I can pick out those droplet sizes that I want. So if I start looking at the fungicides that Carl tells me that I need to put on, read the label and it says it wants a very coarse or a coarse droplet size or maybe it wants a very fine or whatever, I can say, okay, now I can try to find a nozzle that's going to give me that size of droplets. Does that make sense? So where we're going there, okay. Now that also is going to dictate what pressure I'm going to have to run as well, right? Because within those nozzles, as you look at your sheet there, so some of those nozzles, depending on the pressure, I could go, I'm looking at one here that goes from very coarse all the way up to fine within the pressure range that I can run in there. Okay, so that would be great. You know, I could pick one up and says, oh, it's got fine droplets, and then I run it at a really low pressure, and it's coarse droplets. So now I've got big fat droplets, and I may not get the coverage I want. Or what happens more often is, I need a little bit more flow rate. I want to drive a little bit faster. It's getting close to the end of the day. So what do I do? Drive a little faster. It puts my pressure up. I'm getting a little more flow out of that. That's great. But I just took my, my droplet sizes from coarse down to fine or maybe very fine. And now I've got drift. Okay. So that's the management stuff that goes on. This is the game that we have to play. And we could spend a lot of time in, in, inside someday on a warmer day and talking about for a certain situation, how do you pick out that nozzle tip? Okay, so it, it takes some thought and working and, and playing with the numbers a little bit to find what is the best nozzle tip for the application that you have. All right, so maybe that's an exercise for another day that we would go through that. But I at least wanted you to see this stuff to see where that information comes from. Does that make sense? Does that help out? Okay. So we got that much, all right? Then the rest of the table over there gives you flow rates and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you can actually calculate that stuff or you can look it up on a table, but there's a, there's a couple things that we can pull off of that, all right? Now, different kinds of nozzle tips. There's a lot of different ways we can go at this. Now, let's think about this. I want coverage on both sides of that weed head, right? So I want to get it on the front side and I want to get it on the back side. So how do I do that? Now let's think about what goes on if I just have a plain old flat fan nozzle tip and I'm going through the field. Am I going to get good coverage on both sides of that weed head? Okay, where will I get coverage on that weed head? What do you think? So if I'm driving through the field, let's think about what's going on because there's a lot of stuff that's happening here and I want us to, to tear this apart a little bit. Okay, so going sideways, let's think about this sideways. There's my weed head there. So you're watching the side of the boom coming across there. There's that flat fan nozzle and it's trying to spray that weed head. Where are those droplets gonna hit? What do you think? So we gotta think about movement. And a lot of times applicators don't even think about this. They think, okay, I've got this fan that's spraying down so it's gonna spray right on the top of this thing. Well, no, it's not actually because what's happening on moving, okay? And the example I always use with people, okay, you jump off a pickup truck while it's going down the road, what's gonna happen, all right? You hit the ground, you're gonna roll. Why? Because I'm moving with the truck relative to the ground, so I'm gonna move. So if I wanna not roll when I jump off the back of the truck, what do I do? What's that? You hang on. <laughs> No, I jump backwards. So if you know if the truck's going down the road and I want to jump off the back of the truck and I don't want to roll, I jump away from the truck. So what am I doing? The truck's moving this way. I try to move this way relative to the truck, and now I'm falling straight down relative to the ground. We should 
do that as a demo next Yeah, time. you want to do that? Get your truck out. Let's do that. We're going to jump and roll, all right? So, and, and you, you know, you can play that. You were kids one time. You jumped off of stuff or fell off of stuff. You know, we all did stuff like that. Okay, but it's that, that relative velocity that we want to think about. And this is one of the things that Carl and I really went after in the research study last year. And what some of those results are is, okay, how, how do we think about the movement of this vehicle and what that does? Because what do the manufacturers tell us for nozzle tips that we use? You guys have any idea that picking out nozzle tips, what kind of nozzle tips we should use for this stuff? All right, you need to come in close now. So this is one that I'll bet almost every farmer applicator has one of these. That's an 8004. So that's a really common red nozzle tip. One flat fan that's coming out of it, okay? What's this one doing? I got two fans, okay? What are we doing? Why? Ah, front side of the head and the back side of the head. Okay, so there we go. So we got two fans on there. So, and this is kind of interesting because I got a couple of them here that have two fans. So here's two of them that have two fans, and they're a little bit harder to see. Okay, one of them's yellow. One of them. This one's actually blue, even though it's got a red thing on there. It's got the blue size, blue tip. But can you kind of see the two little nozzle tips? That's why I wanted you in close. So there's two holes, one on either side. So what's it doing? Think about what it's doing. Sideways, you're looking down along the boom, it's spraying forward, it's spraying backwards. Okay, so the idea is we think about that weed head now sticking up there like this. We're coming across with that one fan. It's going to spray the front side of that weed head. And we got that other fan that as it goes on the back, as it goes across, it's going to spray the back side of that weed head, right? Make sense? It does make sense, right? Until, wait a minute, think about this whole movement thing. And that's what we started looking at, you know, when Carl called me and I started running some numbers being an engineer, you know, running equations and all that kind of stuff. It's like, hey, it doesn't work. When you look at the physics of this and you look at how fast those droplet sizes are coming out of there, how fast are these sprayers going out in the field? How fast do they drive? 10? Man, that's a slow day with potholes, okay? Some of these guys run 15 to 20, right? So when you're going 15 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour, yeah, that front side's gonna hit that thing, but what that, about that back side, what's it doing? That spray's coming out of there, but that sprayer's moving so fast, guess what? It's still hitting the front side of that weed head. So even that backward spray is not hitting the front side of that weed head, it's all moving this way. Okay, so, oh man, so how do we compensate for that? So what do we have, what tools do we have in our coffers to do that? So. So manufacturers, and that's what this nozzle tip is one of them. And this is the way that it works. So the same kind of deal, you know, the wheat head's right here, and I'm bringing this nozzle tip this way. You can kind of see it's not at an even angle, is it? So what do we got going on there? So that first one, as I'm moving from your right to left, I guess, moving this way, that first one is shooting almost straight down, right? Because when I'm moving, it's going to end up moving, you know, relative to the ground. Those droplets are going to be moving really far forward and moving really fast. So that one's shooting pretty straight down. This back one, what's it doing? It's not shooting straight down or it's not symmetrical to that one. It's shooting back a whole lot more. The idea is to try to get it shooting backwards so that even though the machine is moving, I'm still going to be getting some backward velocity and hopefully I'm going to get some coverage on the front side or back side or whatever you talk about on that weed head. Okay, so you see what's going on? You see what they're trying to do with it? Hmm, does it matter? Yeah, it does, all right? And so that's what Carl and I found out in some of the research that we did, that it does matter how much you get, how much it, you can wrap around both sides of that weed head when you do that, okay? So that's one option people have. This is another option, it's another tip, and that's a really complicated looking tip there. And so, and I've got one of these in the boom. We'll turn on here just in a minute to see what's going on. So that one has one nozzle jet, and actually I have it turned backwards. <laughs> I did it again. I did it earlier this morning. So the one here, and these are like old flood tips. So there's a deflector plate on the nozzle tip right there, and so that deflector plate deflects the spray. And this front side comes down almost straight. The back side comes down and gets deflected out, and it comes out almost in the back. In fact, this number the numbers that T-Jet puts on these nozzle tips, they call it a 3070. And the 3070 means, okay, this front one is 30 degrees from vertical, the back one is 70 degrees from vertical. And so you'll see when we turn it on, it's shooting out 
almost flat when it comes out of the back of that. The idea is now that when we're moving, we got the forward velocity on there, we're going to get some droplets moving forward, some droplets moving backwards. Okay. Now, what else can you do? So, we had some of the best results with uh, these twin jet nozzles that just have two tips that are symmetric. Okay, and what do we do? We said, okay, and we had a little different boom configuration in this. We had like on what some of the commercial booms are. They have a wet boom. It's just a big pipe all the way out across there with the nozzle tips on the pipe. You can take that pipe and rotate it. So all we did is took that pipe and we rotated the thing backwards so that it was taking these two tips and shooting them backwards like this. And that was some of the best results we had with some of those nozzle tips. So we didn't have to go out and buy extra nozzle tips. You just loosen them up a little bit, twist your pipes, spray the nozzles at a different angle, and now we've got better coverage going backwards. Ha, huh, how about that? Not too bad. So there's some ideas. So I got something cool to tell your farmers. Hey, I learned something. We can try this, right? So, I think what the question you're getting to, and I'll come back to that a little bit, but you know, when you start turning sections off, a lot of this is going to be coming down to what, how you're controlling your pressure. So that flow rate is really, really going to be, you know, it's directly tied to the pressure. So as your pressure changes, it's going to change the flow rate, it's going to change your droplet size and all that kind of stuff. So when you start with section control, turning sections off across the boom, that's going to make your pressure go up in the rest of your boom. So you turn the section off up here, it'll go up. Now most of the controllers, especially on the modern newer sprayers, that pressure is going to come down. You know, take a couple seconds or whatever and it will come down. But you'll get a little spike in there and you'll have some um, off, you know, that won't be exactly the right rate for a little short period of time. All right. So, but you got to watch that a little bit. Um, with sprayers like this that we don't have speed compensation, you got to drive the right speed because when you turn it on it's going to be at that pressure and so you've got to maintain a constant speed as you go you know through the potholes through the ditches on the headlands around the corners all that kind of stuff you know you got to do that all right so good question yes sir have you done any work with the pulse width or aim command yeah the the those aim commands and they do work so the the idea the the pulsing what's going on with the pulsing there so the pulse width modulation capstan, their aim control capstan is the main company that has done that. Other companies have copied it, but yeah, and there's, I guess they're still fighting legal battles all the time with that technology. But here, the idea is pulse width modulation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a valve, and I didn't bring my sprayer with me, but I got some on there that we can show. But I'm going to put a valve on each individual nozzle so that I can turn each individual nozzle on and off, not a section but each nozzle. And what I do is I do that really fast. So approximately different manufacturers, different five to 10 times a second. So it's slow enough that you can hear it. You know, you'll hear the thing turning on and off. The idea is that they're going to turn that nozzle on. And when they turn it on, I'm controlling the pressure and the boom and everything. So I know what the pressure is above there. I know what the flow rate coming through there is. I know what the, the droplet size is and all that kind of stuff. So while it's on, it's at that right flow rate. And while it's off, it's off. Okay, so when I come to, you know, the, the ditch in the middle of the field and I've got to slow down, on this sprayer, it keeps plowing it out at the same rate, you know, coming out of the nozzle tip. So now I'm putting more on than I'm supposed to right there. Do I get through the ditch and can speed back up? With the pulse width modulation, they're sensing that speed. And what they do when you start to slow the vehicle down, now I know I don't need as much flow rate coming out of there. Well, if with the with a con conventional control that would just lower the pressure in the boom. To lower the flow rate, you know, that changes my droplet size and then, you know, that's all out of whack now. With the pulse width modulation, as I'm turning it on and off, I'm going to turn it on, but I'm going to turn it off quicker. So I'm looking at how long it stays on. So if I want full flow rate, you know, I turn it on and leave it on all the time. If I want a half flow rate, I turn it on for half the time and turn it off for half the time. On for half the time, off for half the time. If I want a little bit less, I leave it on for like 30% of the time or 25% of the time. So I just t turn it on for a little bit, turn it off. While it's on, I know what the flow rate is, I'm controlling the droplet sizes. While it's off, it's off. So I always maintain the droplet size no matter what the flow rate is. Okay, does that make sense? Does that kind of follow what, follow through? And I've got, a, I wrote a publication a couple years ago that kind of describes that and shows some pictures of what's going on there. So that's what that pulse width modulation stuff is doing okay now the risk you run with that then is 
you get checkerboarding in the field. So I'm turning it on, turning it off, turning it on, turning it off. So, okay, I'm going to spray here. I'm not spraying here. I'm spraying here. I'm not spraying here. So what they do is every other nozzle tip on the boom, they alternate them. So when this one comes on, these are off. When this one comes on, these are off. And then with some overlap on those nozzle tips, then you don't have as much checkerboarding. And there's a little bit of, of micro drift and stuff like that with the droplets are moving a little bit as they're going through there. And so they, you really do still get pretty good coverage with doing that. But that's what the, the pulse width modulation does. Maintains the droplet sizes no matter what your flow rate is or within a reasonable range. Okay? Answer your question? Does that make sense? All right. That's a lot of money. <laughs> so they're like two... I think the last time I looked at them, they're like 270 bucks a nozzle tip plus about five or six thousand for the box that goes in the cab. So, so you're talking a pretty significant cost difference, or pretty pretty significant cost to to outfit a sprayer with that technology. Okay, so wow, we got all that. These are the same size nozzle. It's a twin jet nozzle tip, so they're plastic nozzle tips. So there's two jets coming out of there. You can see, but if you look on the side of this one, it's a little bit fatter. It's got a hole in the side of it that air can go into. This one does not. Okay, so look at those difference between those two. Again, same size, same flow rate at the same pressure and all that kind of stuff, but we should get different nozzle, different droplet sizes out of it. Here's another uh, form, format of this kind of same thing. So two nozzles, tips, the same size. See this one has a really long thing up here and it's got a hole right on the side of it. So you can see that little hole there. It's a little bit bigger. The air comes into there. The idea is Here's the theory of what the manufacturers tell you. So as that water's coming through there and it goes out through that nozzle tip, you know, it goes through that hole in the end and it makes that fan, it gets broken up into little droplets. And so the smaller that hole is and depending on how that hole is machined and everything, you're going to get different sized droplets that's coming out of there, all right? Um, the smaller droplets obviously are better for our coverage. With the air induction, now with that water as it comes through the nozzle, it's actually the Venturi effect. It's sucking air into the air stream, into that water stream. So now I've got air mixed with the water as it's going down through that nozzle tip and it goes out through the end. So what happens is the little droplets that come out when they break up, they're actually going to have an air bubble inside of them. So what you're going to have is a droplet that's a little bit bigger because it's got some air inside of it. So now it's bigger and it's not as susceptible to the drift and stuff like that. And so you won't see that fine mist coming off of it because of the air that's entrapped, that's entrenched in the, in the flow stream as it goes through. All right, blow your mind? It blows my mind. I can't figure, they figured it out and it does work.